of the questions that I get most often is, can you divide by zero? The answer is no, but it's a qualified no. And actually exploring that question will lead us to a secret in mathematics so profound that it is the loophole through which we thread one of the most important fields of mathematics, calculus. Let's take a look. As with all things in mathematics, this one is best understood with a meme. I've seen this crop up all over the internet with different numbers. I've used various examples very similar to it in my own classes through years past. What we're going to do is we're going to take it apart, see what went wrong, and see what we can salvage. It starts off easily enough. 5 times 0 is 0, 7 times 0 is 0, and those two zeros are the same, meaning we have 5 times 0 equals 7 times 0. Easy enough. Now we're going to use an inverse operation to divide both sides by 0, then it's simply a matter of cancelling what's on top and bottom, because if you multiply by some real number and then immediately divide by it, you get back to where you started. On the left side that's 5, and on the right side that's 7. And then we get the nonsense statement, 5 equals 7, which we would normally write a little line through the equal sign like this, because this isn't possible. If you do think it is possible, and you are also my bank, then $25 million also equals my current bank account balance, and uh, in case you were wondering, here's the proof. So. Just, I mean, I mean it's, it's math. So what went wrong? To figure that out, we're going to write down the things we did as general rules, and then see which rule we don't like. The first one is very simple. Anything times zero is zero. And in this case, we're just going to write that with a times zero equals zero. A being just some variable, which can be any real number. The next thing we did was we divided both sides of this equation by zero. But hang on a second, because we actually need to take a step back and see if we can divide by zero in the first place. The mathematical statement that you can divide by zero is simply a over zero equals b. That is to say, if you take some real number a, divide it by zero, you get some other real number b. The last thing we did here was we said that if you multiply by a number and then divide by that same number, you get back to where you started. Making that a rule looks like a times b divided by b gets you back to a. Because we got to a contradiction, and we were really only using those three rules, we're going to have to deal with it, and because it's a contradiction, dealing with it means banning it. We're then free to use the other rules to build our mathematical system. I'm not saying that you can't build a system by banning one of those two things, but I am saying that it would look pretty funny, and probably not be the same system that we use when we're dealing with day-to-day -day stuff like registers and sales and basically arithmetic. And so what that means is that we really only have one option of what to ban. So it looks like the answer to the question, can you divide by zero, is no. However, like I said at the beginning, this is a qualified no. So there's a little bit more we can do here. To find that little bit more, we're going to explore the equation that seems to be at the heart of everything. In a sense, it's like what I did in the mean. I'm going to do something to both sides, only this time I'm multiplying both sides by zero. However, I get a very similar result. On the one side, I get zero, because anything times zero is zero. On the other side, I get back to a, because I have, again, multiplied and divided by the same number, which means that number cancels, getting me back to, in this case, a. But this is really weird. I want you to take a second and just think about this. What is the value of b? How is it that we just nailed down a value for a? The reason I say we've nailed down a value for a is because, well, let's say a was, oh, I don't know, 5. What that means is that we now have a contradiction, because we started with a equals 5, and we ended with a equals 0. This is not possible. a can only be one number, so we have a bit more specificity here. The things that are leading to direct contradictions are in fact those values of a that aren't 0. Those we're going to ban, and we're going to ban in a very specific way. The way mathematicians say this is that this is undefined. That is to say, there is no number we could assign to this expression that makes any sense in mathematics because you always get a contradiction. Now on the other hand, we do know that a could be zero. Like if we started with a equals zero, we just agreed that a is zero at both ends of this proof. That's fine, but that leads us to the other question. What is b? We didn't nail it down. We have no idea what b is. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to say that 0 over 0 is not just undefined, but more accurately, indeterminate. That is to say, we can't determine a value for b based on the expression 0 over 0. This is the loophole that I promised you, through which we thread all of calculus. 
However, I'm going to have to talk about the calculus bit in its own video, not because I don't want to tell you right now, but because I want to give it its own treatment. So in the next video, I will talk about calculus. For right now, though, let's talk about some of the things that people do to try to rehabilitate the situation. That is to say, try to come up with some kind of value we can assign to, say, 1 over 0, or 2 over 0, or any of the things we just banned, basically. I love this particular kind of mindset because, well, I like making things. So if we're talking about something we can't do in mathematics, let's at least take a stab at trying to make it. Why can't we do here what we did with the imaginary numbers? Well, let's think about what we did with the imaginary numbers. The problem was, we had these numbers. They were the square roots of negatives. Root negative 40, root negative 10, whatever. Well, what we did was we essentially said, okay, let's turn all of those things into something times root negative 1. Let's give root negative 1 a name, and though we might not be able to figure out what that is in terms of real numbers, we can just say, hey look, it exists, and try to do math with it. And that turned out pretty well. In fact, we have all sorts of things we can do with the complex numbers now. And that's great. But here's the difference. There were no fundamental axioms of mathematics that we were breaking by writing down the square root of negative 1. That's different than in this case. Here, if we have 1 over 0, we actually get to a contradiction. And in fact, that's kind of going to be a reoccurring theme as we try to invent something to take care of this something non-zero over 0 case. That contradiction really is hard to get away from. Isn't 1 over 0 just nothing? Zero? This is tempting. I mean, think about how it said, 1 over 0, which is a zero with. That certainly sounds like a type of nothingness. Two problems, though. One, we have no definition for a zero with. And in fact, we just got done saying that we can't actually make one. Two, even if we could, it probably wouldn't be zero anyways. To understand this, let's back up a step. Some fractions get simple names, like a half, or a third, or a quarter. The relationship between the name and the fraction itself is usually pretty direct. Consider 1 over 4, which is a quarter. This has 1 in the numerator, and 4 in the denominator. What this means is take 1, a whole, and divide it into quarters, the 4. A third is very similar, as is a half. What you might notice is that the value is getting bigger and bigger as we count down the denominator. When you get to 1 over 1, for example, the value of that is 1. So whatever a zero with is, this pattern would suggest that it's probably bigger than 1, or at the very least, not 0. So unfortunately, that doesn't work. But it does lead well into our next attempt. Can't we just call 1 over 0 infinity? This isn't as crazy as it sounds. In fact, this is the biggest misconception I often come across. The reason? Well, if you consider the pattern below, it turns out that it indeed swoops up in the direction of infinity. To see why, let's expand this pattern by writing it as a function. That is, so far we have only considered a handful of denominators, 0 through 4, but we want to consider all of the possible denominators, particularly the ones in between those numbers. To do this, we'll make the denominator a variable, so we can vary it to anything we wish. Then we'll have to name the function. Let's name this one f. We read this as f of x equals 1 over x. The payoff of writing it like this is that we get all the benefits of functions, one of which is graphing. This is Desmos. I'm not being paid by them, I just really like their web app. Don't worry about this stuff here, this is just what I use to animate the thing. Anyway, this is a graph of the function f of x equals 1 over x. You can see the four points we had earlier in our explorations, that is, a quarter, a third, a half, and of course, a whole. But you can also see all of these little points in here that are in between those values. But there's no reason we have to stop here. In fact, we can continue sweeping towards the y-axis, and we see what I was talking about a moment ago as it swoops up towards infinity. Now why is that happening? Well, consider the point here. This is 1 half comma 2. That is to say, what happens when you plug in 1 half for x? I won't go into the arithmetic in detail here, except to say that the life hack for evaluating these kinds of expressions is to flip the bottom and multiply it by the top. This gives us 2. Going further then, we would expect that when x is a quarter, right around here, that the function value will be 4. And that's exactly what we see. It's also the case that when x is 1 millionth, the function value is 1 million. This is why it's tempting to call 1 over 0 infinity. Because, well, that's where the function is headed. As it happens, we can make a math statement that captures this idea. 
we say that the limit as x goes to zero from the right, the plus signifies the positive side of the x-axis, the function value heads towards infinity. And yes, this is calculus stuff right here. Foreshadowing. But please note that this does not say that 1 over 0 equals infinity. If we try to do that, then what we're saying is that any math we can do with infinity, we can also do with 1 over 0, and as we saw earlier, just writing down the expression 1 over 0 breaks rules. So we wouldn't be covering over 1 over 0's problems with infinity solutions, we would be tainting infinity with 1 over 0's problems. We also need to look at the other side of this graph. Doing this procedure to the left, what we did when we came in from the right, leads us to negative infinity. What this means is that even if you did overcome those earlier problems somehow, you would then be shot down by someone coming along and using that exact same logic to tie the value of 1 over 0 to negative infinity, an answer that couldn't be any more different. So that's it then? Unfortunately, for the non-zero number over zero case, yeah, pretty much that's it. We can't define it into existence like we did the imaginary number i because of that contradiction earlier. We also can't just call it zero because zeroth has the word zero in it. And we also can't call it infinity because we wouldn't know whether or not to call it either infinity or negative infinity, and instead of solving one over zero's problems, it would just mean that infinity now has those problems. Unfortunately, it's just going to remain undefined. But all is not lost. The zero over zero case presents an interesting opportunity. Whenever we come across that in some kind of a calculation, we can exploit the fact that there's no inherent contradiction to come at that problem a different way and see if we can't still solve it. And in point of fact, the problem we're going to try to solve will serve as the foundations for calculus itself. And in an upcoming video, I'm going to cover that loophole. Thank you to all of my patrons for all of your support. Couldn't do this without you. Congratulations to you on reaching the next term in your own Taylor expansion. I'm Derek Taylor, and I will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe. If you really like the video, come on over to our Patreon page where you can get involved and see all the cool stuff we're doing. 